In the participating in its spirit sancti. Amen. So today we celebrate the feast of St. John Eudes, who was a French priest and uh, instrumental in advancing the devotions to the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Uh, these are two devotions that we, I think, there's... Yeah. We all take things for granted in all aspects of our lives, and, and the church and devotions is uh, no exception. You would say, of course, yeah, the devotion to the Sacred Heart, uh, the Immaculate Heart of Mary. We're familiar with these terms, but it wasn't always that way. Uh, there were saints that had to really work and make these the popular devotions that we now have today. So a debt of gratitude to St. John Eudes for that. Uh, so he was born in the year 1601. Uh, right there at the beginning of the 17, uh, 17th century. Uh, he was a very pious child and received his first communion at age 13. It wasn't, wasn't so early back in those days. At age 14, he took a private vow of chastity, and 10 years later, he was ordained a priest uh, in the oratory, uh, or with the oratorians of St. Philip Neri. Um, he spent a great deal of time, he really gave himself fully uh, during the plagues. There was a plague in 1627 and again in 1631, and he gave himself completely to those stricken with the disease, administering the sacraments uh, to the dying and ensuring that the dead had received a proper burial. And he himself uh, became very sick with it, uh, but continued uh, uh, to work. Um, in fact, at one time, to avoid infecting his colleagues, he lived in a wine barrel in the middle of a field. You may think, like, how did that work? Uh, there was, um, at the time, they would make wine barrels that were like a thousand gallons, so like you could actually live in those things. So, um, uh, so he did this, right, uh, very austere um, penances. And after he recovered, after he, um, the, the plague kind of ran its course, uh, he became a very talented preacher and confessor and traveled all over France, uh, preaching missions and making converts from Protestants. Remember, this is, this is gonna be the mid 1600s. So we're, we're about a hundred years after uh, Martin Luther and the religious wars and so on. Uh, so he became quite concerned about the spiritual condition of priests and realized that their seminary formation uh, wasn't, had, wasn't very good and they, they needed to be better addressed. So he himself set to work uh, founding and organizing uh, seminaries and education for it. Also, um, among his parish work that he, he was engaged in, uh, St. John Eudes was disturbed by the condition of poor girls who were caught in a life of ill repute, and they sought to escape. Uh, kind of like the, um, we would know that today as human trafficking. This is something that has always been around for a long time. So he would find temporary shelters uh, for these young girls uh, and, and really worked for um, uh, in helping them to improve and get out of that, that circumstance. So you can see, you know, he's helping the sick, helping the poor, helping young girls, helping priests. Uh, definitely, it, it, um, we see there in John Eudes, we see, what do we see? We see the heart of Christ. We see the heart of the Blessed Virgin Mary very active in everything that he's doing. And this, this, this would eventually come about with his, his greatest contribution to the church are precisely those two devotions, the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Now he drew, he would draw upon the spirituality of two previous saints, uh, Saint Gertrude the Great and Saint Mactilda. They, they, they both were from the 13th century and they spoke about the Sacred Heart and I, I think they also would have spoken about the Immaculate Heart as well, um, but it was just, it was something they wrote about, it, it wasn't really a devotion. And so St. John Eudes uh, uh, com, um, not only, uh, uh, um, I would say, was, was devoted to these, the, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, he actually composed uh, masses in their honor. And in fact, in just three days, we're going to be celebrating the Feast of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. The Mass that I'll be saying is the Mass written by our saint today. St. John Eudes wrote that very Mass. Um, he would also write, write the Mass for the Sacred Heart of Jesus as well. And here's a quote of his uh, on, on those devotions. Uh, we must never separate what God has so perfectly united. So closely are Jesus and Mary bound up with each other 
that whoever sees Jesus sees Mary. Whoever loves Jesus loves Mary. Whoever has a devotion to Jesus has a devotion to Mary. Uh, now that, that should sound somewhat familiar. We were probably not familiar with this quote from St. John Eudes, but we are familiar uh, or more familiar with St. Louis de Montfort. And Louis de Montfort has his, his famous way was to Jesus through Mary. He says, whoever, whoever loves Mary loves Jesus. Whoever has a devotion to Mary has a devotion to Jesus. So we see this is how the saints work. They, they, you know, one comes from one end and the other comes from the other end and then, and then they meet in the middle and they, they're perfectly united. This is how God inspires the saints. And in fact, you can know this is the sign of God's inspiration is that the devotions fit so perfectly together. Um, so we would see, and, and so let's see, richness to richness, uh, devotion to devotion. So St. John Eudes would write these masses in honor of the sacred and immaculate hearts. Uh, but it was St. Margaret Mary Alaco, she's called the Apostle of the Sacred Heart. And just a few years later, in the, in the later half of the 1600s, she, together with Claude de la Colombier, would spread the Sacred Heart devotion worldwide. And um, uh, it is the Masses written by St. John Eudes that the whole world would end up celebrating. Um, let's see. <laughs> Uh, the devotion, and then after St. John Eudes, a specific devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary would come through St. Catherine Labour. Uh, she was a nun with the Daughters of Charity, and her order was founded by St. Vincent de Paul. So, you know, I mentioned a lot of saints, and this is what I want to show. Like we, we should understand that in the church and in the past, and with these devotions, um, this is what we call the richness of the church. When we talk about a rich tradition and a rich heritage, this is what we're talking about. Behind every, every devotion, behind every miraculous medal or, or any medal, uh, behind a, any scapular, any devotion, there's a saint, there's a story, there's a life uh, of miracles and of devotion and of love to God and service to the poor. We find that behind everything the church has. Uh, that's what we call richness of tradition, and that's what people don't know these days. Uh, and I would say in part it's because, um, you know, and this is backed up by, by facts, by miracles, by historical truths, proofs from, you, you can't refute these saints and their lives and what they did and how they all fit together. You can't refute that. Logically speaking, it makes perfect sense. Uh, so what is left to Satan? What is left to the worldlings who hate the church and don't want these examples? Ridicule. This is why against the church, against uh, the devotions, against the miraculous medal, against the scapular, against the St. Benedict medal, what do you hear? You're, you hear accusations. These are superstitions. Uh, there's nothing behind this. This is foolish. We need to leave these things behind. That's not an argument. Th 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 there's no proof behind that. There's no, there's no reason. That's just an attack because they can't. They can't reason against this kind of proof. And so this is what we see. So anytime you hear somebody talking about superstition or the, the fables and legends of the saints, don't believe it. That is, a, 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 what do you call that? That is, um, you know, even, even you might even hear that from, from good priests or sincere people and they think, yeah, well, you know, we have these legends of the past. That, that is a leftover. That is what you get because the whole world has attacked the devotions because they are so powerful and so true. So be very suspicious of, of any of those accusations uh, about the saints of the past. Uh, and you might also hear, too, that, you know, with all these devotions, oh, we get lost. There, there are too many devotions in the church, and there are, you know, a thousand things. We don't need those all. Let's just get rid of them and forget about them. Let's just focus on, you know, Christ and the rosary and a few things. Uh, these multitude of devotions uh, speak to people in different ways. Some people are attracted to this or that devotion. It, it sparks something in them that they wouldn't get from a different devotion. And so it is fitting that, that we have all these thousands of devotions because we have, you know, so many different people and so many different uh, um, uh, perspectives. Uh, furthermore, when somebody comes into the church, it's like seeing, you know, you know what, we don't need all these stained glass windows. Let's get rid of all this gold and silver and there's too many de decorations on the altar. Let's get something more plain. That's the same attitude that is behind uh, a casting suspicion on these devotions. Uh, when people come in, they should be overwhelmed and amazed at the sheer number of it. And when they go and investigate it one by one, they find that richness. There's an amazing story behind every little devotion. There's an amazing saint. Right? That is what converts people. That is what, what, what brings them in and keeps them in. 
So St. John Hughes was, was a great contributor to that with, the, with these, these uh, wonderful devotions we have to the sacred and immaculate hearts. So he would spend the rest of his life uh, in, in involved in this in, endeavor, uh, teaching the whole church how better to love our Lord and Our Lady. And he, had, he wrote two books. Uh, one is called The Devotion to the Adorable Heart of Jesus. He wrote that in 1670. And then 10 years later, uh, he finished The Admirable Heart of the Most Holy Mother of God. And that book uh, on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, he finished it just one month before his death. Uh, he would die on this day, August 19th, in the year 1680. Uh, so this is what God does. He picks these saints. He makes them instruments for his divine plan uh, to more and more make himself known and loved in the world uh, that we, uh, in turn, might become uh, holier and more sanctified, uh, not just ourselves, but those around us. Uh, so it would do for us to recall it, 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 this, uh, um, you know, in any of these days, uh, pick a devotion, find a saint, get to know them, uh, ha have your list of friends. I'm going to know these saints. Th th this is our family, our extended family in heaven. They are there. We're going to get to know them when we get there, please God. Uh, but, but just like we've got these devotions, St. John Eudes passed on this devotion. He made it, he, he, he made it um, uh, more well-known so that we could receive it. He passed that on to us, we the, we the future generations. Here we are, you know, 400 years later almost. Uh, what are the generations 400 years from now, how are they going to know the faith? If we don't tell them, how are they going to know? If we don't instruct our children, if we don't, if we don't know the saints, we can't tell them to anybody. So that's why we have to know the lives of the saints. We have to know what these devotions are. We have to pass it on. That is our responsibility. It, we, we can't leave it to these extraordinary saints. It has, to, it has to come to us, to ordinary people. Know the saints, know the devotions, practice them, pass them on, teach them to other people. Uh, uh, and, and then we can be our part, right, in that link, in that chain of, of, of that, that big family that God has built throughout the centuries. Uh, we can be a part of it. It's our way to thank, thank St. John Eudes and the other saints is, is pass it on to those children after us, even as they gave it to us. Uh, so let us keep this in mind, uh, and let us ask St. John Eudes for his prayers. And God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you for listening. Please remember to click subscribe and to hit the bell for notifications. And in this age of censorship, please consider helping support us at sensefidelium.com. Under the Donate and Support tab, there are plenty of ways to help support the work and to help grow and sustain the efforts of Census Fidelium in general. May God reward you and thank you very much.